Support for Conversations Live Get Your Garden On comes from the Environmental Programming Endowment, the Gertrude J. Sant Endowment, and from viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening, and welcome to WPSU's Conversations Live Get Your Garden On, coming to you live from the Dr. Keiko Miwal Ross WPSU Production Studio. I'm Ann Danahy. Growing season is in full swing, roses are blooming, berries are starting to ripen, and tomatoes and peppers are starting to grow. All of that means questions are starting to crop up too. Joining us to talk about everything from watering and weeding your garden to the benefits of bees are two experts who are also here to answer your questions. Tom Butzler is a Penn State Extension horticulture educator. He works with commercial horticulture operations and landscapers in Clinton County. His areas of expertise include vegetable production and beekeeping. Tom Ford is also a Penn State Extension horticulture educator. He works with commercial horticulture operations and growers in Cambria County. His areas of expertise include nursery and greenhouse production and fruit trees. You too can join tonight's conversation. Our toll-free number is 1-800-543-8242. Our email address is connect at wpsu.org. Tom Butzler and Tom Ford, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for Thanks, having us, Ann. I thought we could start out with a topic that seems pretty straightforward and easy, and I'm talking about watering your garden. It seems like, okay, that could be a no-brainer. You just water the garden, right? Well, Tom Butzler, can you kind of talk, walk us through what are some of the best methods for watering your garden, and what are some common mistakes that new gardeners might make? Sure, so yeah, watering is really important. You mentioned that berries are coming on, tomatoes and peppers. And things coming out of our garden, off of our fruit trees, are very high water content. So it is important, critically important, that they get water. Uh, it's important for photosynthesis um, and just bulking up everything. So, yeah, you, know, you, you got to keep track of the weather, of course. Uh, you know, if we were looking at weather from last year, it was hot and dry, and we really had to stay on top of that watering. Now, it, you know, we're getting some of this natural rainfall and we can rely on Mother Nature to do some of that work uh, for us. Now, one thing you have to be uh, aware of when you are watering, not Mother Nature, but when you are watering, is try to avoid wetting the leaves. There are a number of foliar diseases out there and they need water droplets on the leaf surface to start that infection process. So, you know, you, you see a lot of gardeners that will go out there and they'll water their vegetables or they'll water their flowers, as you see in this video, um, and, and getting the, the water to the roots that way really creates more problems. Um, so if you can avoid, you know, that sprinkler system, that hose, and avoid uh, wetting those leaves, try to get the water to the base of the plant. And there are a number of ways to do that. Uh, you could just take your sprinkler can or hose and water right, uh, you know, around the, um, uh, the stem going into, into the ground. Or you can use some of these um, uh, hoses that you can wrap throughout the garden and they have holes perforated throughout uh, you know, the length of that hose and water can drip out of that and, and, and seep into the ground. And when you're doing that, you know, it, it, it keeps the leaves dry. Now that being said, one other comment is if you like to water, overhead water, for whatever reason, or maybe that's the only way you can water, water in the morning. Give time for those leaves to dry uh, throughout the day. So going into the night, they're, they're nice and dry and, and it halts the infection process for some of those fungal organisms. Okay, that's great to know. So you wanna try to avoid just spraying your garden, but if you are doing it that way, if that's the only way to do it, to do it in the, the morning so it has time to dry. Okay, great advice that there. Is great. And Tom Ford, what about the quantity? How much do you need to water your garden and how do you measure that? Okay, I, ideally, when we think about most crops, we look at about an inch of water a week as what they need to basically keep the plant healthy and happy. An inch of water a week on a per acre basis is 27,154 gallons of water. And when we have fruit hanging, like in the case of blackberries and raspberries, under some extreme stress, we may need up to 54,000 gallons of water a week. Some of it's based on soil and so forth. So it's a little bit more difficult if 
you are using a, a say trickle irrigation or an, or a, an ooze hose or something like that because then what you're looking at is you have to have something like a moisture sensor in the soil which is usually beyond most home gardeners from an equipment in, uh, standpoint it's easier with lawn care because a lot of times for lawn care we're using oscillating sprinklers and when you use an oscillating sprinkler you can just take something simple like a coffee can or a plastic container and set that out in the path of the sprinkler and then let the sprinkler run, measure the water that's collected in that can or that plastic uh, container, and when you hit an inch of water in that container, you can shut your hose off. You provided that inch of water for that week. So that's typically what we like to see is try to measure the water, try to more precisely manage that irrigation system. So, and how much you need to water probably varies on where it is too. You're talking about measuring out in the out in the yard, but if you have a, a potted plant, say, or a hanging plant, do you have to check it more frequently? What are, what are the best tips for that? When, when you're dealing with something containerized, we always say water when it's dry to the touch. So there's nothing better than sticking your finger in the media, feeling it. If it feels dry to the touch, water. Water to the point where you see water start to run out the bottom of the container. And then if it collects in a saucer, it's recommended then to take that saucer off and sort of uh, dump the water out of that saucer. Because if you have a containerized plant sitting in a reservoir of water, then you're more likely to see a root rot, which then can compromise and actually can kill that plant material. And, and, and the other thing for your viewers to remember is that when you're growing in the garden, that is soil. And it has different properties, and you manage it a little differently. When you're dealing with a container, those are typically most often soilless mixes. It's a combination of peat, uh, vermiculite, uh, ground up bark, mulch, um, uh, composted bark, whatever. And so you, you need to pay a little more attention to that uh, because they do drain. They've been formulated to drain very well, not hold water as much. So, um, you know, just keep in mind that you're dealing with two different medias there, soil and soilless mixes. Well, if you're just joining us, I'm Ann Danahy, and this is WPSU's Conversations Live, Get Your Garden On. Joining us tonight are Penn State Extension horticulture educators Tom Butzler and Tom Ford, and our toll-free number is 1-800-543-8242, and we're ready to take your calls. You can also send us questions by email at connect at WPSU.org. And it looks like we have a question. This one came in through email. And Chris has a question and he writes, I recently moved into a new house that would have a wonderful view from the back deck, if not for a line of wonderful hemlock trees. I'm reluctant to cut them down because I like the trees. However, they all appear to have woolly adelgids on them. How long will it be until the bugs claim the trees and should I just cut them down and enjoy the view? Or there are treatment options, right, for woolly adelgids. So Tom Butzler, what would you recommend? Well, I, you know, I would probably get someone to come out, a, a professional arborist to come out and look at it to ascertain how bad first is this infestation. Um, you know, if it's just relatively minor or just getting started, uh, you know, these trees you know, might have a, a long life ahead of them. If it's heavily infested, yeah, you know, it, that lifespan may be shortened. And of course, there are ways to manage it, uh, this. There are some products you can apply with a foliar spray or there's some products that uh, can be injected into the trunk of the tree. Uh, they become systemic, so as the woolly adelgid is feeding, um, it's taking the plant nutrients and also the systemic insecticide that is being distributed throughout the tree. Um, and that's a nice way to try to target this pest without you know, targeting any, or without interfering uh, with any of the beneficials out there or j just other insects. But it really depends on how bad that infestation is. It, it's, not an, it's not an overnight type death sentence. It's kind of a long slog. And then that, uh, the health of that hemlock uh, declines over time. Okay, that's good to know. So great advice. You have some other options too if you want to keep those trees. So one of the other questions that's coming up this time of year, and we talked about it a little bit, is watering. And we've been getting a fair amount of rain though in central and north central Pennsylvania. Is it getting to the point where actually all the rain that we're getting is starting to cause problems? And what should you be looking for, Tom Ford? Are there things that you need to keep an eye out when we have been getting this much rain? 
really all we have to worry about is if we've had the real flooding rains because um, one of the concerns you have is if you actually have stream flooding and the water comes up over a vegetable crop it's considered adulterated so therefore you can't eat that vegetable you can't harvest that vegetable you can't sell the vegetable so we have floods that's more problematic we have had some floods in some areas but overall the rainfall in most cases has been relatively manageable um, we have not seen a wealth of diseases yet as far as um, on plant material we do have some stuff that's emerging uh, we have uh, cucurbit uh, downy mildew that's in new jersey right now and in maryland that's a problem uh, this is powdery mildew here on on a rose bush powdery mildew is more humidity driven so as we get into uh, june late june early july humidity is building powdery mildew thrives on high humidity but as far as rainfall goes it's more problematic when we actually have some of the early april and early may rains because then we see foliar diseases and needle cast on conifers mm -hmm. and we have not seen as much anthracnose this year on our shade trees and we also have not seen the level of needle cast on conifers uh no not as much rhizoctonia not rhizoctonia rab decline needle cast on doug fir so needle casts have been a little bit lighter this year because the rains have been you know a little bit more intermittent um, than we've had in some past springs. And when you're talking about needle cast, you're talking about the trees just losing their needles, kind of shedding their needles on the ground? Right. On spruce trees, we have rhizosphere needle cast. We have another needle cast called stigmina. Both those diseases can knock off the, need off, knock the needles off the tree. The trees can go into decline. Uh, they become aesthetically unpleasing. Douglas fir is more frustrating because it seems we have rab decline, needle cast, and Swiss needle cast, and they seem to do the double whammy on Douglas fir. I've had more calls from people wanting to call down, call, uh, cut Douglas fir this past year than any time in, I think, in my career because of two needle cast diseases. Wow, so can they manage, though, if you, if you uh, keep them for another year or two? Are they going to be able to make through that? The, the problem is the size of the tree. A lot of these trees are 60, 75 feet tall, and we're talking 150 to 200 dollars per application. Most cases, we're talking three to four applications, and then if it rains, it washes it off, and you just lost the effectiveness of that fungicide. And then what happens again next year? We have to do the same thing. The following year, the same thing. So we have to spray prophylactically before we see the onset of symptoms, which is very problematic for most home gardeners. So rather than commit themselves to a life of spraying, they get rid of the tree. Understandable. Well, we do have a call, and this one is from Anne in Holidaysburg. Hi, Anne. Thank you for calling. And do you have a question? Yes. I have a, a six-year-old river birch that's just beautiful. This year I've noticed that it has something that a horticulture guy told me was scale insects. And I want to know if there is a way to treat it that's a natural way other than the insecticide he told me about. Okay, thanks for that question. And I see Tom uh -huh. Butzler nodding his head. So any advice uh, for her? You know, I'm not real familiar with scale issues on birch. Is, is this a river birch or a European birch? Do you know, what, what color is the bark? I'm not sure. Anne, are you still there? She might have hung up to listen. But okay, it, what what I have noticed with um, uh, some of the, the birches when I do scouting and so forth is not so much scale, it are, but aphids. And they feed very similar um, in that uh, they're tapping into the vascular system of the plant. And you've got this honeydew that's dripping out of the, the tree canopy onto park benches or trees that are parked under underneath. And so, um, you know, either you want you'll, you live with it or you're going to kind of have to treat it. Um, and there, you know, there are products um, that are out there that can treat aph uh, aphids. Tom, I'm not sure about scales on birch trees. Well, uh, the fir first thing is I would like Ann to submit a specimen to the Blair County Extension Office so that we could take a look at it first off. Um, in my career, I have not seen scale on birch. So I'm worried about is it could it be a misdiagnosis from that yeah. standpoint. We see lots of leaf miners and yeah. a lot of nuisance pests on birch, but I don't recall ever seeing scale in my career. 
Um, but if you want to try to control it naturally, if first off, we got to figure out which insect it really is. And depending on what it is, we may be able to use, if it's really a scale insect, use something like a horticultural oil. There are some of the oils out there that are um, plant-derived that actually have an, what we call an OMRI label that, you know, are, are organic uh, certified for use on vegetable crops. They would work what we call crawler sprays typically on uh, scale insects so there may be some alternatives there from a natural standpoint to take care of it but we really need to make sure that um, we actually um, accurately diagnose and identify the pest because yeah. that can be very problematic if it's the, if we're we're making making a recommendation for something that's something else right and you know and this goes back to the uh, the, uh, the conversation tom had with the um um uh, the uh, needle cast diseases is that river birch, you know, you could apply those products on a small tree, but river birch can get, you know, what, maybe 40, 50 feet in height once they become mature. And so sometimes that becomes a little unmanageable. So it, it may be, I, I agree with Tom, really, we need to diagnose what is the exact insect problem, but it may be also that it may be not the right tree for that situation. Well, there, there are there are some soft scales out there that um, in the middle of the cloprid material, a neonicotinoid, the birch doesn't really attract pollinators. Um, so you may be able to use a drench of a neonicotinoid yeah. insecticide to get the control without really having a lot of significant sort of you know biological magnification there on site. So we still have to get it diagnosed first. Well, we hope that helps, Anne. And while we're on the topic of insects, what advice would you have for people who want to have a bird bath? So having the birds come into your garden and having butterflies and other animals, having that bird bath out there for them is a real draw for people, but at the same time, you don't want it to be a breeding ground for mosquitoes or other insects. Tom Butzler, any advice on that question? Yeah, I, I got a bird bath in my yard, and it's not so much for the birds, although they're, they're more than welcome, but I also keep uh, honeybees. And in the backyard, I also have a swimming pool. And so the problem I have is this competition for water. Bees, just like any other organism, need water, right? And if I don't provide bees water in my bird bath, as you can see in this video here, they're gonna go over to my swimming pool. And this is a very common complaint that we get at our office and other extension offices across the state, is people that have these backyard pools complain about honeybees uh, visiting to, to, to get a drink. And so I have my bird bath set up to, to act as um, an alternative to my swimming pool. And here's the trick for anyone that has backyard pools and has honeybees and other insects uh, visiting to get water is you have to have that bird bath set up early in the season. Because if they're going to your pool and then you set up a bird bath, um, they are trained to go to that pool and it's hard to break that habit. Get them in the habit of going to the uh, bird bath full of water um, and then you open up your swimming pool in the spring, but they kind of ignore it because they're trained to go to your bird bath. But you did allude to the timing of, of that bird bath on um, uh, some other insects. And the big one is of concern is mosquitoes. Mosquitoes love standing water, right? And that's what a bird bath is. And so, um, you know, you get into the heat of summer, uh, you, you'll need to empty out that bird bath, uh, you know, maybe four or five, after four or five days of having that water stand there. Dump it out and then put in new water. So just so it doesn't become a breeding ground for mosquitoes. Okay, so that's a pretty clever decoy for the, the bees. Keep them out of, your, out of your swimming pool. And we do have a question, and this is from Ingrid in Port Matilda. Hi, Ingrid, thank you for calling. And do you have a question? Hi, Ingrid, are you there? We have you on the line. Well, we might be, we'll wait and see if we get a, a call from Ingrid. And while we're waiting- oh, I'm here. Oh, hi, Ingrid. Yeah, thanks for calling. <laughs> Do you have a question? Thank, thank you, yes. Um, I, our garden was left um, vacant for a couple of years. And in that time, it's been taken over by this horrible weed that I believe is mugwort. And I'm wondering if people know if there's any way of getting rid of that stuff. Okay, I see some laughing. I've never heard of that, that we, Tom Butzler, Tom Ford, what can you tell us? It looks like chrysanthemum. Is that the way you're, you're seeing it in that uh, vacant lot? Yeah, yes, uh -huh. and it's real, um, when you cut it down, it gets real woody and it's got a root that just is everywhere and it just is completely taken over the area. Right, so mugwort's a perennial uh, weed. 
So, um, you know, you, you've got a couple options here. Um, you know, if, if you would take a mower and mow it repeatedly and repeatedly to try to, to, to tap, delete that energy reserve underground, uh, that might put a dent in that population. Um, if it's a small enough infestation, you could tarp it uh, with uh, you know, black plastic and just prevent light from getting there and allow the heat to cook that area. Um, that might give you some control. But ultimately, you know, I, you're probably going to have to look at some type of herbicide to get that under control if it's well established. Um, so, you know, there are, there are a number of products. Uh, there are some burned on type products um, that are organically labeled, um, but they're not systemic. So when I say burned on, it's, it, it'd be like using a lawnmower. You're just burning all that top foliage down. And then that underground energy reserve structure will send up new growth. And then you apply that burned on product again. And then you can go to some of the harsher chemistries such as glyphosate, where you, you apply it and it goes systemically within the plant and down underneath the ground to that energy reserve and basically kills it. And so you do have some options, but it, it's, a, it's a tough nut to crack. It's terrible. And I'm, I'm, it sounds like some of these um, herbicides are probably not something I want to use in a garden I'm going to plant vegetables in in the future. Well, some of the burned down materials actually there are some that actually have a, an OMRI label that are they're considered organic. Um, there is one product uh, that's, I guess, available to the home garden markets. It's derived, I think, from palm oil or a palm-based product. Um, on the farm side, it's called Home Plate. On one coast, it's called Suppressed on the other coast. And I believe it's called Burnout on the homeowner market. I believe it's a bonide product um, in our area but it will burn the plant down in three hours and doesn't leave any soil residue or anything. Now it's not systemic, but I actually like using it in my own property because it's a situation I know exactly if I'm gonna spray something in the mulch, if I accidentally hit something that I shouldn't have hit, the worst thing I'm gonna do is, is spot the leaves. I'm not gonna kill that um, uh, foxglove or that columbine or something desirable and with low pressure, coarse droplet size, I can target very, very effectively. Um, but with mugwort, mugwort actually has got some tolerance, even some of the harsher chemicals. So I, I kind of lean towards what Tom was suggesting. I would rather see you try to use a bird down material, be aggressive with it, or if it's a vegetable garden situation, what I would probably do is just go to very aggressive tillage. Okay. All right. Well, we hope that helps Ingrid and good luck with that. And we do have another call. This one is from Tracy in Holidaysburg. Hi, Tracy. Thank you for calling. And do you have a question? I do. I have a question about the gypsy moths. Um, I live in Holidaysburg in the Sylvan Hills area. There's a lot of oak trees on our property. And um, they're just being destroyed by the gypsy moths. I have um, raised beds. I have one oak. And I have to put um, garden cloths over the raised beds because of the dropping. Uh, is the state going to spray? Is there anything that can be or will be done about these? And how long do we have to put up with them? Yeah, that's a great question. And we were talking about that before the show that because it is a problem in parts of Pennsylvania this year. Tom Ford, what can you tell us about gypsy moths and the outlook? There's a lot of them this year, but there's a little bit of a silver lining, right? Right. There, there's a silver lining, and we've actually seen quite a bit of, uh, we'll say, uh, fluctuation up as far as the population in Blair County, specifically the Holidaysburg area and some of the other areas as well. But when you're looking at gypsy moth, um, they should be just about finished. They are in the, the home stretch as far as feeding goes. Uh, if you look at the caterpillars, they have the very pronounced dark blue dots and dark red dots on them, which tells you that they're in the, the last stage of the life cycle. They're actually harder to control now. So in that respect, uh, I'm not gonna typically recommend uh, usually doing too much from an insecticide standpoint right now. Now, for next year, okay, the state typically will spray some of the ridges, some of the state game lands, but when it comes down to a lot of the private property owners, usually it's up to the private property owners to work together to try to coordinate a spray program for your area. Now, to know if you need to spray or not for next year, um, you want to look at egg mass counts per acre. That, the one photograph showed the, uh, the white moths, the females, with the brown buff colored egg masses egg mass. 
Uh, usually if you have 250 egg masses or more per acre, if you do not treat, then there's the potential to see defoliation next year. A healthy oak tree usually can take two years of defoliation. But beyond that, for the most part, then we can start to see some tree mortality. So the real critical thing is, is do that egg mass surveys in your area this fall. And then at that point in time, that's a, it gives you the opportunity to try to work with neighbors to see if the area could be sprayed privately. Uh, DCNR has a listing of aerial applicators that you can contract with for spraying. That's the most effective way to do it, but they have to be sprayed from about the second week of May to about the end of May. So you get about a, a two week, three week window to do aerial applications of insecticides. And they usually use two materials of choice. They use a BT, a diapel type product, natural, bacillus or uh, thuringiensis, or they'll use an insect growth regulator. I mean, they use a product called Mimic. They're the two materials of choice, but the BT material is really only effective when you have the early instars of the caterpillar, first or second instar, first or second stage. But the good news as far as that uh, Ann was talking about is that if you look at the, your bark of your oak trees and you notice the caterpillars in an upside down V that are dead, or you see the caterpillar hanging down with its head down and it looks like almost like a shoestring, that's natural biocontrols at work. The ones in the upside down V it's an NPV virus, and the other case where they're hanging down like a little um, straw, like a leather string, that is a typically a natural fungal organism. I live in the Duncansville area. I've got gypsy moth, but I look at my white oaks, I look at my red oaks, and I have natural biocontrols at work curtailing that population. When the population gets stressed like it is, we've had relatively good wet conditions. That means both organisms are out there working in the caterpillars late season. So we may not have as many eggs laid uh, in the next three weeks or so. So our population may be much more reduced for next year. But the only way to know for sure, do the egg mass count this fall? If you're over 250 egg masses, work with your neighbors to try to look at if those properties can be sprayed. Okay, that's some, some great advice, and we have our fingers crossed that the uh, natural course will take care of those gypsy moths. And if you're just joining us, I'm Ann Danahy, and this is WPSU's Conversations Live, Get Your Garden On. Joining us are Penn State Extension horticulture educators, Tom Butzler and Tom Ford. Our toll-free number is 1-800-543-8242, and we're ready to take your calls. You can also send us questions by email at connect at wpsu.org. And we do have a call, and this one is from Phil in Johnstown. Hi, Phil. Thank you for calling. And do you have a, a question or comment? Uh, my question is this. Uh, my sister was visiting from Harrisburg, and she was telling us about a uh, new invasive species, plant species, called poison hemlock. Do they have any inf information about that? Is it invasive? Has it always been around? Okay, thanks for the question. Do either of you uh, know about the invasive hemlocks? Are we, is that something that we need to worry about? It's it, it's not widespread like some of these other invasives, but it, it, it is in the area. There are some hot spots, and I believe, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Pennsylvania tries to target some of those hot spots. Yeah, they, I think they try to try to do that because the potential is, is um, for, uh, unfortunately, uh, death. We have a lot of kids sometimes. Uh, kids play with uh, the stems. They're hollow. Uh, we've had kids make whistles out of them and, unfortunately, end up uh, – some cases dying because of the toxin. We have adults misidentify, I think it's wild carrot, and try to cook it up and then die that way from ingestion. The sap is caustic and cause skin irritation, everything else. So it's not a new weed by any stretch of the imagination. And there's that old historical reference uh, we, we see in the literature where Socrates died from ingesting hemlock. Well, the hemlock he ingested wasn't the Canadian hemlock, it was the juice from the water hemlock. So anytime you've got streams and uh, areas that are moist, you will see, unfortunately, water hemlock in those areas. So you can use herbicides, but in many cases, it may be advantageous to um, wear a respirator or wear a mask, eye protection, long sleeves, long pants, uh, gloves, hand pull it, and then get it off your property. 
Try to do so before it blooms. If you let it bloom, it produces copious amounts of seed, and you'll start the whole process all over next year. Um, but right now, um, there's been a lot of media attention. We have a colleague um, at Penn State, Dwight Lingenfelter, um, that's talked about it extensively. But in most cases, the best thing for a property owner to do is typically uh, removing it by hand, but take the precautions to protect yourself. Don't inhale the, inhale the material if you cut it with a weed eater, okay, because you're worried about the, the sap sort of um, getting into the air and you're breathing that material in. So protect your mouth, protect your eyes, gloves, long sleeves, long pants. And then you can use herbicides as well. Okay, great advice. Well, we hope that helps answer your question. And while we're on the topic of invasive species and insects, Tom Butler, can you give us an update on the lanternfly, the spotted lanternfly? That was very prevalent in lots of Pennsylvania and has been moving and expanding, and it's something that can do a lot of damage. Where is it now? How much do we still need to worry about it? Yeah, it's kind of a mess still. And so if, if you go back and review the literature, it was found nowhere else in the United States except in Pennsylvania, Southeast Pennsylvania. And there was an extensive effort to try to contain that invasive insect, the spotted lanternfly, into, into Southeast Pennsylvania. And it was somewhat successful for a while, but it has expanded well beyond uh, that region. So you can see in this map here of Pennsylvania, those, um, air, those counties that are colored in purple are, are where, you know, it's been established for a couple of years. And then those counties that are in the kind of the light blue and the townships in darker blue are these newer finds with established populations. So you can see that it has now gone well beyond Southeast Pennsylvania to other counties um, in the state. And it's even beyond the state now. I mean, it's, it's, it's established in uh, some of the states surrounding touching uh, Pennsylvania and even those ones that are not contiguous. So for example, uh, Massachusetts and uh, uh, Virginia. So um, it, it's not a great flyer, but it is a great hitchhiker. And it has found a great relationship uh, between itself and, and humans. And so you see in this picture here, uh, the different life stages. So I'm up in the upper left-hand corner is the uh, egg mass. Um, that's, you know, the female will lay that in late fall and that's what goes through the winter. And then we get into mid to late spring and uh, that section there titled B um, is the nymphal stage. It's black with white dots on it. And it goes through a couple of these stages uh, before it becomes an adult. And right now we're kind of at that transition between uh, the nymphal stages and the adult. And the adult is in those lower two panels there. And they look like almost like a moth or butterfly. Um, they're, they're not, they're considered plant hoppers or they're categorized as plant hoppers. But we're gonna see this transition between uh, this instar there that is red with the uh, uh, white dots and the adult uh, that will be occurring in the next couple weeks. Um, and so the problem with this insect is it's a sap feeder. It sticks its mouth parts into the plant like a giant straw, and it's sucking out uh, the, the, the plant contents. Utilizes some of those minerals and some of the stuff in there, but the rest of it, it just, just expels, excretes, and everything underneath it becomes sticky. Um, and, uh, you know, aesthetically, that can be a problem. And there is also some concern in agriculture uh, um, that one, it's going to affect uh, certain crops. And the big one right now is grapes. Vineyards uh, are very concerned about this insect because it, it can, with aggressive feeding, kill them. So yeah, it's, there's a lot of literature out there. Penn State has a very robust webpage uh, that has webinars, that has videos, fact sheets, uh, ways to control this for homeowners, ways to control this uh, commercially, um, and a wealth of information. I mean, that would be a whole uh, session on spotted lantern fly on, on this show if we had time. So I encourage people to go to that. And keep an eye out for it. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you. And we do have a call and this is from Mary in State College. Hi, Mary, thank you for calling. And do you have a question or comment? I do. I have a question about growing tomatoes. When you're growing tomatoes, I've always been told to get rid of the stems or branches that are called suckers, a somewhat unfortunate name. And as the plant gets larger, I never, I can't tell what, where they are and which one is a sucker and how do, I know how to get rid of it. But how did you distinguish so you're taking off the right part and not taking off something that will have flowers? So thank you. 
Thank you, Mary. That's a great question. So when you're growing tomatoes and you want it to channel its energy and you want to get the most bang for your buck out of your tomatoes, how do you know which parts to prune? Well, when you're looking at suckering, you only have to do it sort of earlier in the production cycle. Um, unless you're growing them in a greenhouse and you're growing what we call indeterminate tomatoes where we're trying to grow the tomato into a, a long vine um, with no real side shoots. In that case, because the tomato in a greenhouse indeterminate may be 30 feet in length by the time we get to the end. But in a home garden, it's only important probably to do the suckering early on, um, probably for about the first six to eight inches. So you would just take those little vegetative shoots that are in the axles and snap them out. Um, but there really isn't a significant benefit, you know, from doing any, um, you know, sucker removal for, uh, say, beyond those first first couple of weeks out there in, in the garden. Um, some cases, uh, what it may do is it may give you a little early, some earlier tomatoes, maybe than a neighbor who doesn't sucker. But overall yield is actually higher on tomato plants that you do not sucker in the garden. Oh, interesting. So at this stage of the game, you planted them a couple of weeks ago, you're better off just leaving them alone. Right. And most most commercial growers I work with never sucker a plant unless it's in a greenhouse setting. Okay. All right. Good information there. And we have a call, and this is from Kyle in College Township. Hi, Kyle. Thank you for calling. And do you have a question? Hi. Yes. Thank you so much. I am interested in uh, the expert's experience with the jumping worms, if they've, if they've encountered them, and if they have any uh, recommendations for uh, trying to control their spread. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Jumping worms. So I've read a little bit about this. These are not native worms. Is that right, Tom Ford or Tom Butzler? So problem worms? I don't have them in my area, so I'll let Tom take a crack at this one. I, I mean, I know there are they are in Pennsylvania. I know that with the extensive populations, they can do some real damage to the soil, get some drying out around those root structures. But as for controls or anything, I'm not real. I'm not sure. One of the things you're going to run into trouble is what what is labeled legally, okay? And that's what we run into. They are. Uh, gets you to say significant feeders of organic matter, and that's the biggest issue. Uh, they tend to um, sort of almost overmine the soil a little bit as they as they tunnel through and digest organic matter. But there really isn't a, I'd say, a real significant chemical control. I can't think of any product that's available to a home gardener that you could use for control legally. Okay, so this is a new a new problem. We haven't quite figured out how to get a handle on it. It sounds like. One question that's come up, for people who are getting a late start to their summer gardening, is it too late to get in the summer vegetables? Is it too late to plant the tomatoes and plant your flowers? You, are you better off just starting to think about the fall, or do you think there's still enough time you could get something in? Tom Butzler, any thoughts on that? Is it is it too late to start the summer garden, or is there still time? No, it's, it's not too late. I mean, you're, you're, you're not going to get the yield, um, where if you planted the tomatoes in uh, you know middle of May, but yeah, you can still plant. Uh, a, a summer garden, it will just be producing later. We still have uh, a, a good number of months of, of heat and, and sunlight and you know warm weather. But you know it it is also time. That being said, it is also time, believe it or not, to start thinking about the fall garden. And planting for the fall garden starts now. And uh, when I say planting for the fall garden, not in the garden itself, but starting those transplants. If you like to start things from seeds. Um, you know, for broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, whatever, um, you need to start thinking about planting those uh, relatively soon so you can plant your fall garden. So, I mean, in a way, you could call that summer gardening. Yeah, yeah, there you go. And when we're talking about fall gardening, are we talking about getting things out in September? Is that usually the window to start thinking about when it starts getting cooler in the evenings? No, I, for me, at least, I, I'm thinking of planting in, you know, like maybe middle of August. You know, September, if you're planting into September, then, you know, it would be fine for a while, but then you're just going to start pushing up against uh, late season weather. You know, we get some of these cold spells and just the what, you know, the weather just starts dropping off temperature wise, days get shorter. So I, I look at, at, at August as a planting date for your fall garden. OK, like you said, not really that far off. No. So for people who do have their, their summer garden in, they've got their vegetables in, things are, are growing along, how do you know how much to fertilize them 
Tom Ford, do you want to just do that like you water? You want to do that every week? Or how do you know? What's the best approach for fertilizing? Well, ideally, we'd like to see you do a soil test first. And that way we can give you a prescriptive recommendation on the amounts of fertilizer typically to apply. And so uh, granular fertilizers are always the most economical for use. So based on a soil test recommendation, we may recommend to apply 50% of that um, prior to planting uh, the broadcast, plow it down, mix it into the soil, then retain uh, the rest of that dry granular fertilizer and then use it to side dress later on in the growing season, maybe four weeks, five weeks after that crop's planted, depending on what you're growing. But if you're going to be using water soluble fertilizers, okay, where you have not maybe applied a, a dry granular or you applied some early, water soluble fertilizers in some cases can be applied on a week to week basis. In some cases, on a commercial side, um, we'll see growers that will inject into the, the irrigation water anywhere from a half pound to one pound of nitrogen a week. So, you know, you can basically very, um, carefully meter out uh, a little bit of fertilizer each week to meet the demands of that crop. But you also have to recognize that again, each crop's different. Each crop requires a different amount of nitrogen uh, than say another. So in the case of sweet corn, you may need 120 to 150 pounds of nitrogen to the acre. That's maybe one of the highest fertility crops that you need. You go to something like a tomato, you may need 80 to 100 pounds of nitrogen. So what we're typically looking at is prescriptive application. And the other thing you have to look at is an analysis. Um, a lot of home gardeners like to use a 20-20-20 uh, water-soluble fertilizer. That 20-20-20 is 20% nitrogen. The nitrogen source is typically urea plus ammoniacal nitrogen. And that ammoniacal nitrogen uh, tends to um, impact potassium uptake in that tomato. So if you over apply a triple 20 fertilizer, sometimes you get what we call green shoulders or yellow shoulders in that tomato fruit. And you maybe get what we call internal gray wall or you get a greenie in the inside of the fruit. So you have to be very prescriptive. So a lot of times once we have a tomato plant that goes through what we call the reproductive phase, when it starts to bloom, we like to switch to a fertilizer that's got higher potash levels, like a 91530 or a 41838. The last number in that fertilizer analysis is potash. And so often in order to prevent yellow shoulders or green shoulders in a tomato fruit, as soon as we get that first bloom, we switch to a fertilizer that has a lower nitrogen level and more potash. But typically with water solubles, we like to apply a little bit each week to meet the needs of that crop. Okay, well that's great advice. And it sounds like if you're not sure about it, because it could get a little bit complicated, especially for a new gardener that maybe you want to reach out to Cooperative Extension, reach out to an expert on it to get some advice about what to put in your garden, how much fertilizer and what to do if it gets a little bit complicated and tricky and you want to make sure you get it right. Well, if you're just joining us, I'm Ann Danahy, and this is WPSU's Conversations Live, Get Your Garden On. Joining us tonight are Penn State Extension Horticulture Educators Tom Butzler and Tom Ford. Our toll-free number is 1-800-543-8242. You can also send us questions by email at connect at WPSU.org. And we do have this question by email, and this is from Keith. And Keith writes, what's the best way to control multiflora rose? Are those the roses you see like on the hillsides growing everywhere? They're just in, invading? Abandoned pastures and yeah. Best way to control it, I don't know, uh, t uh, tie a rope to it, chain to it, and pull it up out of the ground. Just try to pull it out wholesale. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it, you know, it is a perennial, and so the idea, again, very similar to, to, to the, uh, the mugwort we were talking about, is that you, you need to eliminate that top growth. It may send up new vegetative growth, but you've got to deplete that energy reserve. So, um, you know, you could you know, use some sort of hand pulling tool, uh, but you also have the use of, of herbicides. You know, and the other thing, I, I was up in New York um, a couple of weeks ago and they were around a sensitive area where there was poison ivy, um, but there was some other vegetation that they needed to get a, a, a rid of and they could not use herbicides. 
and they brought in a herd of goats uh, to, to do that repeatedly taking down of the top vegetative growth. If you can just get rid of that top growth, it, that plant wants to survive. It's going to send up new growth. And then something comes in and takes that new growth off, and that plant's going to send up a new growth again. Eventually, it's going to be so exhausted, it's going to die. And so they were using goats to do that instead of, you know, a lawnmower or a bush hog. And then they couldn't, of course, use herbicides in that situation. Okay, so you could just kind of keep pruning if there's some reason, if it's not easy to just pull it out or if you've got a whole mass yeah. of them, just keep pruning them back. Or, or maybe you could get a, a goat to help you out. <laughs> that, that gets it within the, the range of, of possibilities, too. Okay, well, we hope that helps with uh, dealing with those fluoros because the same thing applies with, like, uh, honeysuckle or other invasive shrubs, too, right? They can just fill in the area, and you've got to find a way to get it under control. Yep. Right, but, but again, sometimes herbicides sometimes are the best option. Um, you just have to look at what is planted around it. When you're making it, when making an herbicide uh, choice, like in the case of multiflora rose, you can notch the trunk, you can wound the bark, you can apply an herbicide just as a targeted point, spray yes. to that fresh wound, and therefore maybe not impact other stuff that's nearby. Um, if it's if the multiflora rose was in a pasture, we have lots of grass. We have herbicides that are selective that will kill the multiflora rose and leave the grass intact. So it depends a lot of times where the plant is located, and that sort of provides us like what our chemical options are going to be. And how about on the other side of that, if you want to plant a tree or shrub or transplant one, is this a time of year? Is it still okay to do it, or are you better off waiting until the fall as we move into the, the hot weather for summer? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, 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 not, it's not the optimal time to be planting trees and shrubs. I mean, it can be done. But the optimal time, when you, if you were going to rank them, the best time to plant would be in the fall so that it has two seasons to get ready for the upcoming summer, the following summer. It would have that fall, the winter, and, and, and part of that spring. The second best time would be a spring planting so that it has, you know, several weeks, a couple months to get ready for this upcoming summer. But the problem with a summer planting is it doesn't appear to be an issue this year, but last year was just hot and dry very unforgiving and unless you stay on top of things and really you know pay attention to watering and and, and other issues um you could lose that tree or shrub so i'm not saying you can't plant it in the summer but it is takes a, a, a extra attention and care and it, you know it, you know we talked about the start of this um uh, uh, program the issue of watering in the garden yeah that would be very important watering around these trees and shrubs well, one thing that's been getting a lot of news coverage lately is the giant Asian hornets or so-called murder hornets. Is that something that we need to worry about in Pennsylvania or is that something that we have not seen yet and is not likely to, to come anytime soon? Yeah, that's, so uh, what was it? About a year ago, I think there was an article in the New York Times that did a, a big splashy story on this giant Asian hornet and people kind of went, went nuts and so one of the reasons they went nuts as you can see in this this graphic here is this giant asian hornet up in the upper left hand corner that looks very similar to some other insects that we have flying around in the mid-atlantic region and so people were claiming that they had the this this giant asian hornet this hornet is only found in the pacific northwest uh washington state and uh, a, a little area of canada and it really hasn't been found outside that area. And they are monitoring this closely because this is, you know, kind of the same thing as a spotted lantern fly. It's an invasive pest and it's bringing a whole slew of problems uh, with it. And one of them is, is it's, it's a very a big concern for beekeepers because this hornet will go into a hive, whether it's a wild bee, honey beehive or a managed honey beehive, and they decimate the hive. They basically tear the heads off of, of the honeybees as they just destroy the hive and then go for the babies, the immature, the larva. And so, th th you know, that's kind of a detriment to having this, this invasive pest around. But it is not around here. We do have a lot of folks looking for it. There are traps set up in the Pacific Northwest uh, to monitor these. And these insects are big enough that they can put tracking devices on it um, and follow it back to its nest so they can exterminate that nest.
Wow. Okay, so we'll know when they get here, and hopefully that won't happen. And, and we do have a call. This is from Simon in Center County. Hi, Simon. Thank you for calling. And do you have a question? Yes, I was. I was calling. I know that it's not the ideal time to transplant uh, ferns, but is it too late, or should I wait until fall? Okay, great question. Any thoughts on that? So it's not ideal, but if he wants to maybe baby the ferns a little bit, could he still transplant them now? And, and I'll hang up and listen to the answer. Thank you. Thank you. In, in my opinion, I, I, I would transplant if, if, you, if you want to transplant as long as you can provide the care and culture. And there's some ways to get around it. We talked about watering, but sometimes reducing uh, the sunlight a little bit, you know, shading them a little bit more if they're in a brighter location. Um, as long as the roots are moist uh, and the crown is, is firm, usually you'll get good regeneration. Some cases you may need to, if you had five fronds, okay, remove three of them, leave two fronds left. Let them photosynthesize, let them feed the plant, let them cut down. Uh, by cutting them out, you'll reduce some of that moisture loss through the foliage. Um, even when we do some canterized materials, some cases you can reduce water loss by cutting the leaves in half. So you have less photosynthetic area, but you're also losing less water through the leaf as well. So if you need to transplant them, go ahead and do it. Just baby them. All right, great advice. And we have a few minutes left, and what we wanted to do to end the show this time is just to give people a look at the to-do list. What are both of you looking at doing, trying to make sure that you get done this summer? What's on your gardening agenda? So Tom Butzler, we'll start with you. What's on sure. the to-do list? Yeah, so there's a couple things that you can do. I've already mentioned the first one there is uh, the cool season crops. Good time to, if you're starting things from seed, to do that shortly. Uh, for those folks that have asparagus in the garden, um, you know, if it's a well-established patch, you can pick about, you know, four to six, four to seven, eight weeks. But we're kind of ending that time period where we can harvest this asparagus. It's start to think about letting it go to ferns so they can photosynthesize, get energy reserves down into that system uh, for next growing season. Um, Tom and I both mentioned some of these garden diseases, and there are some very good websites to track uh, this uh, uh, a downy mildew that appears on cucumbers and other cucurbits. Uh, and you can see that on there. That's usablight.org. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, the cdm.ipmpipe.org uh, is for the downy mildew. The USA blight tracks uh, late blight on tomatoes. So those are very good to see if they're in the area. Uh, groundhogs love tomato plants. Love them. So for some of us, we may have to manage uh, groundhogs. And really the only way to do that is to maybe trap them, live trap them, or put up a fence. So something to think about. And then... There we go. How timely is this last number five point here with a, a caller we had um, earlier on this idea of trees and shrubs. If you're going to do it, you really need to pay attention to the water issue. Right now, we've been plenty of water, but if it was like last year where it did spigot, Mother Nature just shuts off, it's going to get hot and dry. Right. So that's some great advice. And Tom Ford, what about you? What's on your list? We have just a couple of minutes left. Well, one of the things that I really want to look at right now is uh, bagworms. Bagworms were a real problem for us this this past year. Uh, the populations out there are very significant again this year. If you're going to treat for bagworms, you got to do it now. The later we go, the more problems we'll have. And the other thing is, Japanese beetles will be emerging soon. So, uh, in order to minimize uh, white grub problems and turf destruction. What you may want to consider is is doing your white grub treatments very shortly. Take advantage of the moisture that we have. That'll help make those uh, grub products work a lot a lot better. Um, with cicadas, prune out the damaged tissues. Try to think about doing soil testing late summer. And then the other thing is is that if you have powdery mildew or seeing diseases out there, try to think prophylactically and apply those fungicides before you start to see any type of uh, infection. And if people do have questions and they come up with questions that they didn't get answered tonight, are you available? Can people reach out to you to get their questions answered or go on to the Extension website? What's the best place to get other information? Yeah, Tom and I are more than happy to answer questions. But within the state, uh, within Pennsylvania, we have a very robust program, a Master Gardener program that, mains, that, that uh, maintains a garden hotline, garden hotlines throughout the uh, um, uh, the state. 
And so I encourage people to take advantage of that. Um, they they, they um, do a lot of diagnosing for us. You can send in pictures. I don't know if they're, stu- if they're yet handling um, uh, face-to-face um, office visits, uh, but uh, either the Master Gardeners or Tom and I be more than happy to, to help folks out and diagnose their uh, pr- plant problems. Okay, that's great to know. And it's great to know that all that information is available online too. And we have just a couple of seconds left, but Tom Ford, what are you looking forward to most in your garden? I think actually planting bulbs this fall. Um, I uh, did a, a good bit of bulb planting in the past fall. And so I'm trying to increase the diversity of my, my spring flowering bulbs. I planted some liatris corms earlier this spring. I'm waiting patiently for my liatris to bloom there. The spikes are starting to emerge a little bit. So um, I guess you could say I'm really waiting to plant bulbs this fall when it cools down a bit. So starting to plan ahead already. Well, I just want to say thank you both, Tom Butler and Tom Ford. Thank you so much for joining us and for answering all of our questions. Our guests tonight have been Extension Educators Tom Butler and Tom Ford. I'm Ann Danahy. Thank you for watching and listening to WPSU's Conversations Live, Get Your Garden On.